Well, good morning again. Uh, We're in a two-week series called Mirror, Mirror, and what we're trying to do with this series is take a look at a couple of uh, really serious, big mental health issues that people struggle with, Um, really just two of the major ones. And last week, we talked about the mental health battles of anxiety and people wrestling with anxiety. And so I just want to review a couple thoughts from last week, just kind of catch you back up if you haven't um, if you haven't been caught up with that. But here's a couple thoughts. The only way to overcome anxiety is to fight. You must fight if you want to overcome anxiety. I, I don't think anything is going to happen on accident when it comes to overcoming anxiety. And so there must be a battle. There must be a war waged. It's not going to happen in a passive way. Uh, another thought is about gratitude. And Brene Brown uh, told us this. It's not joy that makes us grateful, it's gratitude that makes us joyful. In other words, when we start focusing on the things that, make, that we are grateful for, um, those things start to turn our thinking around, and then we can have joy because we have displayed gratitude first. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. And so rejoice is one of those things, that's, it's pretty close to a starting point in the battle of anxiety. So I said I was going to share two thoughts, but I lied. There's three thoughts. The, the last one is this. No matter what you're fighting or what you're going through, we have a promise in Scripture. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. And so today, I want to speak about depression. We talked anxiety last week. I want to talk depression this week. And I'll say that the only way to overcome depression is to fight. Now, last week I kind of gave the disclaimer that I was going to go really fast and I was going to provide resources for you if you needed that. I I have that again this week. I have uh, some extra ones uh, about anxiety and I have the one today about depression if you want to come and grab that. If, If we run out, just let me know and we'll get you some more. We'll make sure that you have all that stuff that you need. All right, here's the deal with depression. It's not a new phenomenon. Now, it's diagnosed more in 2023, but I believe that it's because we've learned more about it. Science has learned more about depression. Now, in the Bible, it's not specifically named depression, but there are many things that are recorded that sound exactly like depression. All the way back in the New Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, one of the prophets of God, says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And in Jeremiah 20, he says, Cursed be the day I was born. Cursed be the one who told my father I arrived. Cursed be that man for not killing me in the womb. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? Now, depression is not mentioned specifically. That sounds a lot like depression to me. Many of the people God used in the Bible suffered from depression for whatever reason. But here's the deal with that. God uses humans, and humans come with problems like depression. However, God never left any of them unattended, unloved, or forsaken. He was always with them in their struggles, just like he is always with us in our struggles. Now, You might wonder where depression comes from, and I'll give you some points of origin, and it's not a complete list, um, but these are kind of the major three areas that depression originates from, and so I want to share that with you. The first one is an organic or biochemical imbalance, all right? Some, I mean, we live in a broken world. Sometimes stuff don't work right. We're just being honest. Sometimes things don't work right. You could have a dysfunctional thyroid or blood sugar chaos. All of those things can contribute to depression. Another one is unrecognized pain or unprocessed hurt. That's another point of origin when we're talking about depression. Injuries, um, mental injuries, physical injuries, whatever it may be, if they aren't dealt with, they tend to fester whether you want them to or not, if you don't process them and deal with them. And so if we don't resolve some of the things of our past and our traumas and our hurts or whatever, um, it begins to run roughshod through our lives. Another way, and this is the last one I'll tell you, is is maybe it's an abusive relationship um, that has just defeated you mentally. That's another source of depression. And this often happens with narcissistic parents or narcissistic partners in your life where they make you feel like everything is your fault and nothing about you is good enough. These are just a few points of origin for depression. 
I want to also share some of the most common signs and symptoms of depression. I have to go kind of quick through this stuff because I want to get to Jesus. Um, but the most common signs and symptoms of depression, significant changes in appetite and sleep patterns. That's, that's one of the, the more predominant ones that people will have to deal with. Uh, prolonged sadness or unexplained crying spells. I didn't have that one up there, sorry. Irritability, anger, worry, agitation, anxiety. Okay, that's great. Pessimism, indifference, loss of energy, persistent lethargy, feelings of guilt and worthlessness, inability to concentrate, indecisiveness, inability to take pleasure in former interests and social withdrawal, unexplained aches and pains, and recurring thoughts of death or suicide. But that's not the end of the list. Persistent sadness. Anxiety, emptiness, feeling that there's no pleasure or joy in life, a total lack of self-esteem, constant comfort food cravings. Comfort food cravings are interesting because you want to eat something to make you feel better, but then you feel lethargic, which makes you feel worse. Then you go back to the thing to try and make it, try and make yourself feel better, and you end up feeling worse again, and it's a terrible, terrible cycle of depression. Very low to non-existent energy levels. And probably the worst part about depression is that everything feels hopeless. Hope feels as though it's gone and there will be no relief. Now I shared with you last week that I have and do struggle with anxiety. Nowadays it is less persistent because of the fighting that I've done and that I've learned how to do. And I'll be vulnerable with you again. I, I have and do struggle with depression. But what I've learned is that if I don't fight back, it will overtake me again. And if you are dealing with depression and you have fought and you've come to another side of it, you know that it wants to come back and get you, but you have to keep fighting it. Now, I'm going to share my personal experience here because a lot of people want to know what depression feels like, especially if, they, if they're not a person who struggles with depression or deals with depression. They want to, well, what does it feel like? Aren't you just sad? Like, can't you just get over it? No, <laughs> you cannot. And so here's, I'm going to share, this is my experience. This is not everyone's story, but this is my story. My own experience and how I would describe it is this. Depression can make you feel like the only possible chance for relief is suicide. Depression, like anxiety, forces you to make up lies and scenarios to affirm whatever tragedy you're imagining. Can you remember the last time you cried? Anybody? Remember the last time you had a, like a real hard cry? And so if you know that feeling when you're about to cry, how you f it kind of it fills up your body and then it gets to your head and then there's this release valve of our eyes that let that pressure go out. Depression is just like that except there's no release. So all of that feeling of pressure in your head and in your brain and in your heart and everything that's going on, you get to that point but you can't, there's no relief from it. You don't get to cry. Depression makes you want to cry, but doesn't allow you to cry. And so you just have that pressure. Now, that is just my experience. It happens to other people in many different ways, but that was my experience. But here's what I want to say when it came to my depression and to anybody else's depression that you've ever struggled with. Depression is not the end. It's not the end. At least it doesn't have to be. So here's the good news about depression. There's another side to depression. There's another side to it. So this message isn't really a message about depression. This message is about hope. And so if you're struggling with depression or you know someone who is struggling with depression, there is hope. And we need hope in this world. I mean, honestly, we, the world ain't great. The, the world's not in a great place, and so it's very easy to see how some people, and you may even get into these places too, where you're like, what is going on? Is it ever going to get better? What's going to happen? And so we need hope. 
In the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 6, the author talks about an oath that God made to Abraham and his descendants. And he says of that oath that we have that hope as an anchor for our soul. So God made this oath, and we can put our hope in that oath. And that oath, that hope, is an anchor for our souls. He says that we can anchor ourselves to God and to his promises because he also says in that passage, it is impossible for God to lie. So we can anchor ourselves to it knowing that God can't even lie about what he said to us, that he will be with us and near us. These promises are strong enough for us to anchor our lives to and then we can have hope because of what God has promised and what God has said. Loss of hope is perhaps the most draining physical, mental, and emotional struggle struggle of depression. But for us to regain hope, or someone struggling with depression to regain hope, you must fight. And if we choose to fight depression, we can regain hope. There is hope for people struggling with depression. Now, if you are not a person who struggles with depression, but you want to learn more about it, or you want to help someone that you love, um, in the packets that I've left up here, there are some do's and don'ts and some other resources that you can check out if you have somebody that you want to try and help through the struggle. Okay? Cool? Yes? Good? Are you guys just thinking about Mike's hamburgers? Was he cooking them as you were coming in? Is that what's going on? Everybody just thinking about beef? Okay. All right, so since we got to fight, I want to give you a few ways that we, that we can fight depression. I'm going to give you five ways to fight depression. The first one is this. It's humility. And I said this last week about anxiety. We need to have enough humility to admit, I need help. We need to have enough humility to admit that something is wrong. And I believe that without just a modicum of humility, we'll never get to a place where healing can happen. We'll never get to battle depression if we can't get to a place where we can say, I am not okay. And to admit, I'm not okay, requires humility. Another way, and I've talked about this before, is medication. Science has come a long way uh, in the medication area, and I encourage you to speak to your doctor or encourage you to help someone speak to their doctor. In my experience with medication, I started on a very low dose and went up and then settled down in the middle somewhere, and so I have a very, you know, <laughs> good, I had a good doctor help me get to that point, but I know that this medication helps me, and I know that it can help someone else too. I would also suggest counseling, and I think the best thing about counseling is that a counselor who is trained can help you discern your thoughts, your emotions, your traumas, your current trauma, your unresolved traumas, everything about your life. Over time, they can help you discern those things, figure out what's real, what to deal with, and how to deal with it. And so I encourage counseling for everyone. I would also encourage you to aggressively distract yourself. Aggressively distract yourself. Now, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but pickleball works for me. Have I talked about that at all? Um, pickleball is something that's great for me. It's a physical activity that I can get engaged in. But if you're not into that, that's cool. I get it. You, you know, whatever. I'm not offended at all. Um, so here's another thing I would do. I would tell you to aggressively distract yourself. And, and I'll give you some science behind it too. Uh, I would say take a walk by water. All right, go, go for a walk near water. I would encourage you specifically to go to salt water for two reasons. Salt water air is shown to contain magnesium, and then you have the vitamin D from the sun, and those two things working together are very good at helping overcome depression and deal with depression. And we live in a perfect area for this because there is salt water everywhere. And uh, I, I would suggest, I like Fort Monroe. I like going out to Fort Monroe. And uh, also Grandview, if you've been to Grandview. Have you been to Grandview Nature Preserve, anybody? It's the best place on the peninsula. I mean, it's better than Chipotle. It's better than Chick-fil-A. It's awesome out there. So aggressively distract yourself. And then the fifth way to fight depression is just Jesus. It's just Jesus. And I hope you know, and I hope you can tell, I think I think medical and science and Jesus all work together in harmony to make these things happen. I really, truly do. 
But if you use medical and science and don't interact with Jesus, give your life to Jesus, submit yourself to Jesus, then you're just healthy for here, for now. And Jesus helps us with our health eternally. Jesus, I believe, wants to help us fight our depression. I mean, you're not you when you're depressed. And Jesus loves you for who you are. I mean, he is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And there are promise after promise after promise in the scripture that I will be with you. And so I think it's important when we're fighting depression to remember Jesus is with you. You're not alone. You can talk to him. You can pray to him. Many of the people that you see going through something in the Bible spend a large amount of time just praying, just praying, just praying. But then they get up and do something. It's also part of the fight in depression. But I believe that there is another side to depression. All right. I, I am one of these guys, and I know it's 2023, and it's, it's um, you know, a lot of Gen Xers don't believe the Bible anymore, or they just believe the parts that they want to believe or that make sense to them, and I think that's just basically a problem throughout a lot of different generations. But I, I am a Gen Xer who I happen to believe that when God said he created the heavens and earth, that he knit me together in my mother's womb, that he put you together in your mother's womb, I happen to believe that. I, are there questions? Yeah, I have some questions. But I happen to be a guy who believes that. And I think one of the greatest things that God has given us is our brain. Now, you might have listened to me for a while now, and you go, well, Wayne, like, your brain... Hmm. Maybe not. But God has given us a brain that can do amazing things. And I don't know if you know this or not, but you can use your brain to convince yourself of something. Isn't that weird? So in the same way that you and I can use our brains to convince ourselves of something terrible, we can also use our brains to convince ourselves of something amazing. I learned, uh, I, I relearned about cows this week. And you know cows, um, I think they have four chambers in their stomach or something like that. And uh, what they do is they walk around all bored and lonely all day and they just eat grass. And then they swallow it and then they throw up and they eat it again. And they do that uh, about seven times before they just let it go and get more grass in their mouth. And, you know, that's disgusting. Um, you know what that process is called? Anybody know what that's called? Ruminating. Chew, chewing the cud, ruminating. Uh, ruminating is the word that I want to focus on in that because um, when it comes to our brains, what we often do is we will take some thought, we'll put it in there, we'll chew it up in our brain, we'll throw it up, and we'll go, oh, you know what, let me take that back. And we do that with negative things. But we can also do that with positive things, God-honoring things, life-giving things, and we should. The reason that cows do this is not because of a, there's not enough grass. They do it so they can get all of the nutrients out of that grass. Here's how the Bible tells us to ruminate as human beings. In Philippians 4.8, brothers and sisters... Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This is what the Bible, this is what Jesus wants us to ruminate on. It doesn't mean that we ignore pain or trauma or anything that we've gone through. It means that we focus on this. And by focusing on these things that are on the screen, we can change our neuro pathway. You can change your neuro pathways in your brain by ruminating on the things that are good and true and trustworthy and praiseworthy and excellent. And you can change them to the negative just as well. 
I think the brain that God gave us is amazing. So let me ask you, what would it be like for you if you ruminated on these type of things instead of what could go wrong or what is wrong? Could you change your brain? I think yes, and so does the Bible, and so does science. So I want to give you three things to remember here. If you're struggling with depression or know someone who is, or if you just need something cool to remember from church today, here's three things. The first one is this. You are not alone. You are not alone. Psalm 23, 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. A shepherd walks with and guides their sheep. They don't just send them out and say, well, good luck with the wolves. They're with you. So you are not alone. Another thing to remember, Jesus hurts when you hurt. He was made of flesh and bone, so he was not immune to emotional pain. When his, best, when his friend died, Lazarus, the Bible says that he wept. I believe Jesus felt the joys and pains of living in this earthly body. And so to me, it's easy to conclude that when his children hurt, he hurts. Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He's there, he's in the fight, he's with us. The last thing I want you to remember is this. There's another side to your suffering. In John 14, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Easier said than done sometimes, right? If we're going to be honest. But why? Because I'm going to prepare a place for you so you can be with me where I am. I'm going to prepare a place where you can come and be with me eternally. There's another side to our suffering. But it's not just the eternity piece, right? I believe Jesus is with us. I believe the Lord is near. I believe he will not forsake us. And all of that points to the other side of suffering. I believe there's promises to the other side of suffering. Even if you suffer all the way until your last breath on this earth, there's still another side that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And we can have hope in that because God cannot lie. Perhaps the most used weapon to distract, intimidate, and emasculate the followers of Jesus is to convince us that there is no hope, no healing, and no other side to what we're going through. But Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. And Jesus is the truth. And the Bible tells us plainly that the truth will set us free. Jesus will set us free. Church, there's hope in the knowledge that Jesus is with you, that God cannot lie, and that you will not be forsaken. May you rest your heart and mind in that hope. May you rest your mind knowing that Jesus gave his life to set you free. He did that when he went to the cross. And every Sunday here at Northampton, we take just a minute to remember what Jesus did when he went to the cross. And you know, it's, it's funny about the cross because uh, the Bible tells us that he endured the cross scorning its shame. So he could get to the other side where redemption was possible. That redemption that Jesus offered is for everyone. Anyone who wants to accept him, anyone who wants to bring themselves back to him, to give them to give Jesus their life. It's available for everyone. Hope is available for everyone. None of that is possible without Jesus. None of that is possible if Jesus had just died and stayed in that grave. But he came out. He rose in a new life and he brings us hope. When you're ready, uh, does anybody need an, uh, a little communion pack? Because Mr. Laverne will bring you one. When you're ready, take just a moment to remember the body of Jesus, the sacrifice that he made so that we can have hope 
in this life, the blood that was shed that washes our sins away when we give ourselves to him.